as we're talking about the summit, um, being navigating our onward journey, we wanted to bring forth the topic of ancestral ancestors because we have to take a look back before we talk about moving forward. So the, it, it's kind of works that we're both starting with this topic. But um, before we kind of move into things, I brought my ancestor with me. So I'm going to take a minute to um, just kind of honor that. Um, one of my ancestors, it is my father. Uh, he passed away 16 years ago on October 1st, um, 2007. And I've got this beautiful necklace that my mom gave me. So he's going to be joining us tonight and whatever he calls us to do for tonight, I'm going to honor that. So again, we talked earlier about this new episode. I don't know how we're supposed to go. So I wanted to do that in honor of an ancestor of mine. That, that's really good. Thank you, Kalisha. Um, I'll just open by saying my heart is just echoing with all of the love and presence that you all are bringing to this space. And I feel like it's a great honor for us to share with you our lens on how to heal our ancestral roots. Some of the questions to kind of get us set up are, who are our ancestors? What is ancestral healing and why does it matter? What is the connection between personal history and ancestral lineage? And how can ancestral patterns um, impact our lives. So I'm going to just put those in the chat and those are some things to ponder if you feel called to respond to that. Um, maybe, yeah, let's do that in the chat. Yeah. Um, so we'll give you all a second to, and if you don't, that, that's fine too. It'll be an ongoing conversation during our time together. And I might need help if there's things that get put in the chat that we don't respond to or see, feel free to flag us because we'll just be talking and sharing with you all. I'm going to go to the next slide here. And so the things that we aim to talk about tonight with you all um, is the introduction to ancestral healing, again, from the lens that we are viewing it through, our own personal experience uncover ancestral stories, identify patterns and beliefs, build our ancestral healing plan. So we thought before we dive into ancestral healing itself, we need to think about what and who are our ancestors. Um, again, as we mentioned earlier, with the setup of this the summit, um, these are the things that we're bringing forth to you. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. This is what we've um, researched and found or feel feel called, but there's there's more to this. Um, as Quinn said, we're all bringing to the pot. So if you have, if you know anything, feel free to put it in the chat. But so far, these are the ancestors that um, that we're aware of, and that's um, yeah. These are so ancestors are more than just the human family blood that we typically think about when we hear ancestors. Ancestors are all of these different things and, and many more. Okay, as I mentioned, um, yeah, we, we think the first start is the human ancestor, which is family. And again, we're thinking, a lot of times we think it's just the blood ancestors of ours, our parents, our grandparents, great grandparents, and so on. but. Family is also, ancestral family can also be your adoptive family. It can also be your chosen family, family that you, bring, you know, people that you say are your family, but they're not necessarily blood family. Um, however you identify chosen family. Those are um, the, the different types of family that we think of. And again, there could be very many more, but to acknowledge and honor how you are represented in your ancestors. Think about who were they and what patterns and patterns in them do you see in yourself? What can you learn about yourself through the experiences of say your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents? What were they taught and how does that show up in you today? 
What traumas did they experience and how does that impact you today? What were their beliefs and how does that impact you? What were their traditions? Were those, um, were there traditions that were rooted? And where were they rooted? What did they do for a living? What were their passions? And what was, um, was there any physical, emotional, or psychological abuse and did it get repeated? And I want to acknowledge that you might not know anything. There are people that don't know anything about their blood family. Um, but if you have any information about your lineage, uh, then you can tap into them by even just imagining some of these things. And as we continue to go on through the presentation tonight, um, the other ancestors that we'll share might help you answer these questions as well. So just know that um, we acknowledge not everybody knows blood family or even with the adoptive family or just a little bit of information can lead you on a path of discovery. Okay. Kalisha, do you want to share? Yeah. So, um, yeah, someone just mentioned the mm -hmm. land, which is definitely um, on the list of what we consider the ancestor, territorial ancestors, um, considers the land and the mindset of the people who cultivated the lands. Land has a spirit, an identity, or personality. And this is why the land acknowledgement we did was important. Um, again, some questions to ponder. What was the mindset of the leaders who oversaw the land? What is the mindset today? What were the traumas of this land, such as natural disasters? I'm going to insert um, one of, during one of the openings, Ray had mentioned um, the territory that we're on, most of us are on, that are here today in Arizona, um, or the land that's called Arizona, how the waterways, um, our ancestors created that, and we're still benefiting and using that. That's an example of the land of the ancestor. Um, some other questions, what were the collective traumas of the people who were on that land? Were there wars, genocide, oppression, prosperity? Did your family choose the land they lived on or were they forced there? What would you say was the mindset of the people on the land in your ancestors' days? How were your ancestors instrumental in the care of the land? And was the land more thriving then or now? So again, just some questions to think about when you're thinking about the ancestors of the land. You want to share your example? You want me to read first? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I was waiting on you to share about Shay, but thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, it, I can go ahead and then, and then I'll pass it back to you. Okay. Um, so when I mentioned the, the um, land having an identity, a spirit, a personality, some of the examples for me that come to mind, um, recently, earlier this year, I, I visited um, the land of Hawaii, uh, Honolulu, and when I got there, I just really could feel the spirit of Hawaii um, and the peoples there. Like I, what I just mentioned really showed itself. Um, and so that was, I definitely could, could feel the spirit of it. And then two other examples that I wanted to share um, as it refers to embodying a personality. Um, I, I travel um, across the states quite a bit and two of my favorite places, New Orleans and Vegas. And they're kind of a juxtaposition of each other. I think of if, if they were both humans, I think of New Orleans as this authentic, rugged, rough around the edges, raw, real, unapologetic, um, person, but no, who knows how to have fun. I, I think of someone that's got, you know, tattoos, is just, just somebody that just has this roughness about them, um, you know, like just live life. They have that look about them. And then with Las Vegas, I look at that as a person that's wearing a mask, you know, lots of makeup, lots of glittery clothing, just hiding what's going on underneath um, with all of this exterior. So those are two examples that I wanted to share that, um, really just kind of is an example of how the land is um, can have a spirit and personality. Yeah, I love that example. Um, I'll share one before I read. When I do a similar presentation where I work 
on ancestral healing. And one of my favorite stories about having a sense of place of where we come from that connects us so deeply to that place in ways we sometimes don't recognize or we forget. I was working with a woman from Cuba, and she had shared with me that she met another woman um, at this where I work, from also from Cuba. And the sense of connection that they instantaneously had because they had come from the the same place, the culture, the food, the music, the essence of this place, how it lives within us so deeply, um, and how it can bypass some of the ways in which we connect verbally, getting to know people. But having a sense of place really changes the game for some folks. Um, And I recently learned on my own maternal ancestry And I say recent because we haven't known it for all of our lives, but maybe in the last three or four years that my mom did the African ancestry DNA test. And it came back that um, her DNA connects to the Fulani people living in Nigeria. And I remember opening the envelope with this sense of gratitude, appreciation, and connection that I didn't know was alive within me, that there was a place that we have come from. And that there's a culture of people that I'm connected to who I've never met. But I feel that once we, I do land my feet on that place, that that connection will become blossom even greater within me. And so the sense of place is so important. Cultural ancestors. This assesses the history of ancestors of, say, your sex, your gender, your race, your sexuality, and your religion for which you identify. Um I'll just say, as an example, as a woman, me and my fellow genders are shaped by the thoughts and experiences of those before us. Um, And some questions to consider for the culture of your ancestors is what is the history of the people of your identity? What were the collective traumas of these people? What was the mindset of the people who were opposite of this identity? What was the mindset of the people who shared your identity? What barriers did they experience? Were these people persecuted or silenced for being their identity? How did they survive within their identities? Um, I'll I'll add some things to consider in addition to the questions that Kalisha has asked is, um, are these these ways of being that may have gotten passed down, are are they working for you? Have you um, taken some time to consider, is it true for me to show up in my life as the traditions and ways of being that have been passed down to me and that I have received? Um, And what could be different? So I'll just pause with that question. Are they working and what do you want to be different? I'll move on. Okay, I'm going to read Kana's. Uh, reflection here. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. I grew up with a deep respect for the the people, Hopi and Navajo. They are my ancestors by marriage and birth on their land. One of my past lives was a San Carlos Apache. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Here we go. Um, All right. So we put here vocational ancestors. This considers the people of a vocation, profession, or line of work, such as architects, painters, nurses. They all have their own line of ancestors. With vocations, what were the passions or professions of your ancestors, and how did that come to be for them? What is the history of their vocation? What is the history of your vocation? What barriers or traumas did people experience as a result of being in this vocation? Were people persecuted or silenced in this vocation? Was it ever taboo? And what was the mindset of the people in this vocation? So I want to talk a little bit about spiritual traditions and um, the ancestry of how we work with spirituality, how it gets invited into our lives or forced into our lives. Um, and some of the questions that are posed around spirituality that you can consider. What spiritual practices, traditions, rituals do you currently practice? If you want to share any of those in a chat, that'd be awesome. 
what's working for you, what isn't? Do you have a circle of elders to consult with? Or do you desire a circle of elders to be to walk alongside you or guide you? Are there new traditions that you'd like to create? If so, what intention and meaning would you want them to hold? Is there a desire to keep it private or shared? And I guess with this reflection around spiritual um, ancestry, as human beings, we create what we need in a moment to help sustain us, especially through times that are difficult, um, where we need something greater than ourselves to lean, lean on or have faith in. And a lot of the traditions that have been created over time are, in my opinion, a, a way to weave in the oneness of all that is so that we feel connected to something greater than ourselves. And in some instances, those spiritual traditions have harmed the individuals who participated in them. Um, and so there's healing that's needed around that for people to even feel a sense of how they might connect, what that might look like for them and things they can practice. Um, and what has, one of the things that I talk about in my weekly presentation is that ritual and ceremony can be really healing and restorative ways of reclaiming the things that didn't get honored or that were um, violated in some way. And that we have permission and agency to create traditions that are more resonant and align with our hearts and spirits and our souls. There's another thing I wanted to add, share is I'm wondering what you're feeling called towards, if anything, that needs um, some repair. So I'm going to give you a minute or two to write down if there is a, a, a sense within you that something generationally generationally that might need repair that you would like to bring some focus to tonight during this meditation. This could be an opportunity to bring focus and healing to that. Um, or if there's a desire to know more about who you are and what your gifts are to offer your ancestral lineage um, for those who came before you and also the descendants. And the descendants may not be human in human form, it could be animal, um, the land, um, so sense of place. So take a few minutes to think about what might be showing up for you. Hmm. So this invitation to participate in this guided meditation is just that. It's an invitation, as I'm going to assume you are well aware um, if you'd like to have your cameras on, you can. You can have them off if you feel that that's a safer place to be. At the end of the meditation, I'll uh, gently guide you back to consider turning your camera back on if that feels good for you. Um, and so we'll start with having, if you're sitting upright in a chair, if your feet are on the floor, to feel the connection of your feet touching the floor. If you are laying down or in some other position, um, maybe if you can connect to your tailbone. I just want you to bring your awareness there for this second. With your left hand, find your belly button. And with your right hand, place it over your heart. I'm going to invite you to notice if you're sitting and your feet are touching the floor, the soles of your feet. And all I want you to do is to connect to this part of your body and the surface that it's resting upon. And as you do that, breathe into your lower abdomen, right beneath the belly button, if that's available. Allow your breath to extend the belly and letting it fall back to its natural position. And if your body's in a different position, allow your tailbone to become the anchor of light that drops down to the earth as deep as you can imagine. 
And you can do both if you're sitting with feet on the floor. You can also drop an anchor from the tailbone. And if it feels safe to close your eyes, allow your eyes to fall closed. Or maybe allow your gaze to be pointed towards a spot in front of you. And to continue to breathe into your low belly. Be connected to your toes. And see if you can notice each toe individually. I'm going to invite you to imagine you can breathe into the soles of your feet. And as you breathe each breath, allow that breath to flow to the soles of your feet with ease. Even to feel the pressure of your foot pushing into the floor if that's available. And to drop your awareness to the floor beneath your feet. And if your eyes are closed, to be curious what's the material that has created this grounding that your feet are resting upon. And we're not going to spend much time, but just to notice it. And then to imagine as you have roots growing into the earth. And as you inhale each breath, those roots reach down a little bit deeper. Allowing it to be slow and easy. And so perhaps you connect with the tree root. And with the tree's permission, you ask if the tree will allow you to wrap your roots around that tree root. And if not, find a rock or a stone that can hold the anchor for you. And as you're connected to the depth of this place, the earth of Gaia, this essence of energy, the vital energy of the earth, allow it to flow up through your feet and into your legs. And allow it to flow in with the inhale as if you're sipping it up through a straw. Allowing it to flow through your body, nourishing your cells along the way. Moving up into the top of your head and down your arms. Feeling the vital energy of the earth. And as you're connected here, offer her a few words of gratitude. Maybe the love that got that opened up in your heart when Elizabeth was inviting us to tap onto our heart center. Allow that love to flow into the earth as well. And as you breathe in, connect to your belly button. This place of connection to the womb that carried you into human form the stars and galaxies that exist in the universe also exist within you. And this belly button can be a cosmic umbilical cord of connection to those who came before you. Step onto the light, lighted gateway, pathway to be seen, to be loved, to connect. And the love that was needed for those who came before us through their struggles and journeys and celebrations that may have not been there for them. Allow that love to live inside of you in this moment. To be amplified with your soul's light. And if it feels safe, call in the names of those who you can name whether they be a bloodline, a tree, 
a rock, a stone, an animal. Invite them in to this space. And as you do, ask them what messages would they have for you today? What wants to be remembered? What needs to be healed? And to weave that thread of love in and out of those stories as best as you can in this moment with your breath. And after you're done on this umbilical cosmic pathway, highway of light, to come into your heart, to allow that love and remembrance, if it's present, to be present within you at a deeper level. And to offer a message to those who came before you, whatever it is you'd like to say. And as you feel ready, come back into this body, time, and space. No rush. You can say your goodbyes for now to allow your eyes to slowly open. And to allow yourself, if you desire, to come back on screen when you feel ready to re-engage in the circle. So we talked a little bit already. Um, some folks have shared identifying patterns and beliefs, impact of ancestral patterns and beliefs and approaches to healing. Um, you know, we talk about intergenerational patterns, what got carried forward. One of the uh, American theologians, I'll say, Richard Rohr, has a quote that says, what doesn't get transformed gets transmitted. And that's just a little nod to intergenerational traumas that we carry within our bodies and in ourselves. Um, and that's true for many people who have come to this land or the lands that they live in. Um, and I guess the recognition around the ways we that what we have access to to invite healing. Uh, I like to guide people along the path of self compassion, love, um, with that both and dynamic being present. It's not all rainbows and unicorns, and some of it is really hard to connect to, and to allow the truth of that to be present. If we can allow ourselves, if we have the capacity, to invite some self-love and compassion for the bodies that we are in uh, and allow that vibration to transform the cells in our bodies for the healing that we can do now, for the privilege of awareness that we might have now. Um, so that can be a pathway in to our own healing. Um, there are lots of different practices that are have been around for millennia to support people uh, some of the things I like to invite people to consider is body movement, qigong, tai chi, whatever is true for you, being in nature, sitting with a tree, holding a stone, um, singing a song, even creative expression is a really powerful healing pathway that people might want to explore for themselves. Yeah, I, I was going to comment on the, the patterns and belief systems which people have um, noted mm -hmm. in the comments. Um, I think the the key point is recognizing, yeah. like acknowledging. I think that's the first step. And at the minimum, even if you're not comfortable with tapping into nature or these other things, like just notice, you know, what is mine and question things. That's that's what I've started to do. Just start questioning. Go back to when we were kids and we asked why all the time. And then we've gotten conditioned into following all following things, following rules, and, and stop questioning. 
Um, and I think when we go back and ask ourselves, why, why am I doing this pattern? Why am I, you know, I think that that's a great starting point. So that's, that's all I wanted to add to that. Thank you. And so hold on to the things you want to celebrate and continue. That again, that both and with the question and be curious about what, what's being carried forward and what's being honored and what traditions are in place and the things that feel really important to carry forward, um, knowing that it all could change as needed. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide here. Um, so these are some of the questions we've been asking throughout our whole presentation. What needs healing? What do you want to reclaim? What do you want to celebrate and honor? Um, we have some self-reflection questions also. Yeah, I was, um, some of the question, additional questions, reflection questions, or what steps can you take to continue the ancestral healing journey? Some of the ideas are, you know, we can set intentions for ongoing exploration and healing, creating a personalized plan for integrating ancestral healing practices into your life. Yeah, creating ritual can be a powerful part of a plan. Um, or a ceremony, and whether or not in deciding if it's a recurring ritual that you want to do on specific dates, um, because I think a ritual is, for me, a ritual is something that is recurring, and a ceremony can be a one-time event. So setting intention, thinking about uh, creating altars for healing could be ways um, so those just a few things that I'll drop because if we're getting close to time, just a thank you. Stay connected. I also want to thank oh, all pleasure. of the ministers that came before us for setting the stage and getting people into their bodies, into their hearts, mm. into their breath, to the kindness and gratitude and all of the love. And mm. it just helped create this beautiful offering that we all created together. So I just wanted to lift that up, say thank you so much for setting us up. Yes. Thank you. To, thank you. Yeah. And thank you to everyone that participated because um in, in terms of with our share, because that was the collective 